guys welcome back to the big shift today my special guest is mayor langsky the grandson to mayor langsky the man himself these guys uh charles lucky luciano benjamin bugsy siegel they engineered the modern day mafia now there's a big film just released in the u.s called langsky and we're going to be talking to the grandson on Mayor Langsky now to go right and through the myths to what the man was actually like. Coming next. Hi guys, welcome back to The Big Shift. My next guest today is the grandson of Mayor Langsky. Before we get into that, I've just got to say thank you for um, everyone going into uh, www.stephengillen.com. We're going to come soon with our new business mastery series. You know, our aim is to inspire and really elevate uh, a lot of you guys out there and support you on your own journey. But now let's get right into the raw content. Mayor Langsky is a iconic organized crime figure. Uh, the film, Langsky, was just released in the UK, uh, US uh, on the 25th. We're going to play a little bit of this unbelievable trailer now, guys. Mr. Langsky, is there such a thing as organised crime? I have no knowledge on the subject. Mr. Langsky, it's a pleasure. Why does David Stone want to write a book about me? Maybe I like stories about complicated people. Anything I choose to tell you is off the record until I give you permission to put it in the book. Any conversations you have about me, I want to know. Betray me, and there will be consequences. Now, I want to introduce Mayor Langsky the second. Hi, Mayor. Thanks for coming on the platform. Thanks, Steve. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh Talk about this great movie that just released called Lansky. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. Um, Harvey Cartel. The first thing I have to say is thanks for coming on the platform. Now, I know behind this great man, you know, and he was an iconic figure. Yes. He died when you was um, in your late 20s, right? Yes, I was 26. So I had Didn't quite you? a bit of time with him. Absolutely. So yes. we can really get to the bottom of what your grandfather was really like. Yes. We're going to get there. First, let me ask about Harvey Cartel in the film. Did you like it? Yes. When I saw the trailer uh, for the first time, I was so surprised that he uh, emulated my grandfather so perfectly. Um, I thought I was watching my grandfather again. It was very, uh, uh, you know, Kind of emotional for me at one point and he was also uh, dressed like him of course he's jewish he's about that age at the end of his life so it really uh was kind of uh jarred me a little bit and i couldn't wait for the movie to come out of course because the trailer was so impactful to me um did a perfect job it sounded just like him like he used to talk to me especially the part where he's telling uh David Stone, played uh, by Sam Worthington, anything that goes in this book, I want you to, <laughs> he was very dynamic like that, exactly. So, uh, you know. Harvey Cartel, I mean, I see the film, a powerful film, really. You know, powerful. Of a yeah. powerful, a powerful life lived, right, you know, and we're really going to get into that. So, look, I'm going to, you know, there's so much content on, on your grandfather, obviously, another listeners are going to be fascinated. So let's take it right back. You know, he was actually born in uh, Belarus, right? He was born in Belarus. Belarus. Came to the United States in around 1911. Uh, his father was here, my great grandfather, of course, like mm. a lot of men, they went on first and started working, lived in the Lower East Side, very, uh, you know, seven days a week, everybody worked and he was a, uh, he sold clothes, you know, he worked in the garment district, like a lot of the uh, immigrants from uh, his area did. And uh, my grandfather then came over with his mother and uh, his brother, Jake, 
and they came to uh, meet up with their father and get started in the Lower East Side. Of New yeah, York. his father, you know, his father, uh, your family, they come, he come a couple of years before him. Right. You know, and then may have come, you know, he come over. It was that same thing. I had the same thing, I've got to say, the young kid with the case in his hand, all the immigrants, you know, he really was the real thing. Yes. You know, he come over and it, it would have been very tough for him in the neighborhood at that time, right? What was it like? I mean, he would have, he's told you a lot of stuff about what it was actually like, right? Yes, he, um, he said his childhood was so rough, he didn't even like talking about it. Now he told my dad this, he did talk about it to me when I was eight, nine years old in grade school, going into junior high. And you know, the, the typical things that go on when you're growing up. And uh, he said, you know, Mari said uh, I had a lot of situations where I crossed over into different neighborhoods with Italians and Irish, and I had to stick up for myself and I had to fight sometimes. And he says, you have to be more aggressive at times like this. And, you know, when I was, you know, I was in grade school, so nights kids push each other around. So he, t he would talk, refer to his childhood and how he, you know, his advice to me on how to handle these kind of situations of just, uh, you know, normal things that when you're growing up and uh, how he handled them. And There's a story. There's a story there. You know, I'm sure you'd have heard it. Uh, Lucky Luciano, actually, how they met was he tried to extort money from your grandfather, Mayor, on his way home from school. But he put up such a such a resilience against it. This was the start of their friendship. Is that right? That's that's a true story. He, uh, you know, the Lower East Side of New York borders within a block. You're in the Italian section or the Irish section, and he was walking across the Italian section. And normally, uh, kids would they had gangs and uh, they would give their money to the Italian kids when they would, you know, threaten them. They would just give up their money and move on. The Jewish kids would. And my grandfather didn't. He was ready to fight. And there was probably four or five guys, Luciano being the leader. They were all younger at the time. And uh, he was very impressed by the fact that he had such courage and he was such a little person. And he didn't expect that because normally he would get uh, the money from those kids, you know. So that instantly grafted them as great friends for the rest of their life and, and business partners and everything that became after that. So unbelievable story. Yes, it is. I, I can, I can imagine it. I really can. And you know, all credit to your grandfather, right? So history tells us the rest. So look, you know, when they came over, I mean, and they was, you know, you know, he was part of the Jewish you know, the Jewish circle, the Jewish gang, as you are, you keep to your own, especially when you're very fresh and you, you know, you, you know, you're making your way. So this is where he met Benjamin, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, right? Because they was very tight. He was Jewish too. Yeah. Yes, he was. And uh, he had a reputation in town. Ben was about five years younger at the time, uh, early teens. You know, in the neighborhood, uh, it's about a five block radius and you had the Delancey Street Bridge. There was a lot of gambling that went on underneath uh, that bridge, illegal gambling and run by uh, older mafioso that had already been here. And one day my grandfather's watching a game after work. He worked as a tool and die maker, at, you know, with the, our cousins, Zelensky tool and die. And uh, he's watching a game and a fight broke out. And a gun was dislodged and it hit the ground and a kid jumped out and grabbed it. And prior to that, he had not met Ben, but he knew who he was. He knew about him. And he said, throw the gun down. You're crazy because the police officer was running straight for him, blowing the whistle. They'll arrest you. You don't want them to know you. So they jumped behind a couple garbage cans and avoided uh, being arrested. And that's how he met Ben Siegel. And uh, Ben was had a mind of his own. He was kind of mad at my grandpa, but he did listen to him. And they became childhood friends and uh, all the way through their lives. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, you know, we're gonna really get into to their journey together. But I yes. want to go around this same time because of the way Luciana was, they was all younger, these guys, you know, you'd have like the Irish who came to the Irish, the, the Italians who came to the Italians, uh, Jewish to keep to the Jewish. 
course, this changed later, and we're going to go there for that as well. But after that time with Luciano, they kind of forged together, you know? Uh, they had the Bug and Mare uh, gang, didn't they? Tell us about that. And what happened in the younger days between these guys, Mike? They associate, you know, they they worked for the older guys at the time, watching games, doing, you know, uh, kind of uh, apprentice work, you might say, at that time, right? And uh, they all worked together, and they were all friends. Um, they got, you know, the, the main thing is they all worked together. A lot of the older Jewish or, or Italian men at that time did not like the idea that Jews were starting to infiltrate into the Italian mob basically and gangs and they saw what was happening so they felt threatened by it but um yeah they all grew up on those streets together and bonded and uh you know trusted each other uh got to know each other's strengths they were all good at figures they used my grandfather used to tell me a story as, as a young boy he would they would play with cards and dice and they would throw numbers at each other verbally and say add that up add that up so they were all good. They were always testing each other. It was like a game to them. And that's all they all became very proficient with odds. And they knew all that by the time they were 14, you know. Uh, so they had a, a great yeah. background. Yeah, you know, and there's some, there's some very, there's some great dialogue in the film. And I couldn't help thinking, me with my background and how I know how this stuff works, it was just so authentic. I could just imagine that the way he portrayed the character, that the way he would say these things and the things that he would say. We're just going to put a bit more of this stuff in there now. I'm an angel with a dirty face. Tell what you tell yourself so you can sleep at night. I don't have to tell myself anything when I go to sleep at night. It's the way we live. It's business. Yeah, and they were some um, unbelievable characters. So what did he tell you about what um, Lucky Luciano was actually like in his younger days? He was a great leader. Um, he, had a, he was one of these type of people that people listened to, you know, his own people especially, but he was able to keep his power even when he was – uh, over in Italy, and they sent him out of the country back to his homeland. So he still had power. Even in prison, he had power. So um, if you've ever been around one of these people in your life that just seem to have a natural ability to, you want to look up to them and ask them and wait for their advice, that's what he was like. Strong leader, influential. He was, and he was certainly, I mean, these guys, your grandfather, this was, they built the mob, really. It was, it was know, a no dream man, combination. Yeah, yeah, they had, you know. They come after, didn't they? How about Anastasia? These kind of, they come after, you know? They come yes. after. So, you know, they really were the origins of, you know, the mob in the States, as we know it, in a sense. Yes. Right. The modern day, the modern day mob, right? Right. The now, American was, version. Absolutely. They, yeah, yeah, that was what they were. Because the two men before them, Masseria and Maranzano, who both came from Sicily, they were the old school bosses. They did not want anybody if, unless they were Italian. They did not like the Jews. Um, but Luciano, my grandfather and Ben, uh, they knew at one time that they would be taking over and they were going to Americanize this to just what worked. They all worked together well. They didn't care about the tradition so much anymore, you know, so. What was, um, I have to ask, what was, Bugsy Siegel like then? Was he one of, you know, what was he like? What did your grandfather say he was actually like? Well, you know, I never asked my grandfather about Ben Siegel. He died 10 years before I was born. I've talked to my father and I knew his daughter fairly well when she lived here in Las Vegas. But it's it's an odd thing. As, as much as you can know about Ben Siegel, and you do know that he was rather flamboyant, for that type of background, <laughs> you know, he put himself out there. He came to Hollywood. He was more or less a Hollywood gangster. Um, there's still a lot of mystery that surrounds him. And it's really difficult even for me. And yeah, I have one degree of separation from knowledge that most people don't, but he's still mysterious to me. 
and, and, and I'm a big fan myself, and I'd like to know a lot more about Ben Siegel because of the fact that yeah, he was kind of secretive. Yeah, I mean, Mayor, I see him, you know, I see him as a real tough guy. You can see that with him. You can tell, right? He was that way, but he was very flamboyant. You know, he was George Raft and all these guys. He was around all them. He loved them. Right. Yeah, he wanted to be a film star. He was always reading scripts. I think he was even reading the script in Beverly Hills where he, where he, where he got shot that time. I'm not sure, but, but um, you know, so we really... You know, he was an upfront kind of guy like yes. that. He had a lot of class and stuff like that. But you can see that he was also the real thing. He was a real tough guy. So, you know, it kind of got me thinking, was he the, the hair trigger guy where, or was he, you know, was he more of a more of a thinker? He was obviously very, very intelligent because it went a bit wrong for Ben after. And that's why, why I asked that. He made a few mistakes. Well, you know, he did. Um, he did have, was known a little for his temper at times, not as much as, you know, artistic license states it, that's for sure. If that was the case, he would have had problems years ago. So he did listen to people. He had lawyers. Once in a while, he'd sue somebody. If he had to, he wouldn't necessarily go and threaten them. Uh, he went through his lawyers. When he was pressed really hard, um, sometimes, he, you know, his, his temper would take over a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, and I'm sure there was times it, it's true he did have a violent temper at one time or another. But you know, he, uh, most of the time, people that knew him that I've even talked to say that you would never know he had that side to him. He was very gracious, very much a gentleman. He didn't even have a New York accent. He wanted to, when he came out to Hollywood, he wanted to level that because he wanted to be a perfect person. He didn't want anything. Uh, you know, any barriers when he was talking to people or he just wanted to come across as a smooth, savvy man like he was, well-dressed. Thanks, that helps. That really helps that, Mike. That really does. Yeah. Um, look, here's the million-dollar question. They say when it started going wrong for Ben Siegel with the Flamingo and he borrowed all that money, Flamingo, the Flamingo Hotel. Yes. Feel that. And of course, all the mob's money was going in there. It was on his shoulders. So we're going forward a little bit here. It wasn't taking so much money. It was at a loss. Then they say, your grandfather went back in there and he sorted it out again. It started coming up again. Then it took some other kind of hit. Now, a lot has been said about this. There's no doubt that they was very, very tight. Ben Siegel and your grandfather. Now, I know that he says he wished he wouldn't have died, but do you think in the end where other forces went to your grandfather and said, look, Benny's got to go, do you think he said, well, he's made so many mistakes, he's got to go, or do you think he fought for Benny's life to the end to try and save him? I think he fought for his life to the end, for sure. I'm sure he talked to Ben many times prior to all the... Uh, money going out of control and whatever, you know, the, the, the reason it went over budget so much. There were some legitimate things. You know, my grandfather used to tell me uh, when I was in uh, my 20s and I was in college, uh, I expressed that I wanted to be in the hotel industry. So he was taught, you know, he knew a lot about that. So we talked about it. And he said, you know, it's one thing. They had the El Cortez Hotel prior to the Flamingo. And that was previously already built and they took it over. Ben Siegel handled it himself and he actually made a profit within eight months, sold it and had money that they reinvested in the Flamingo. So when I was talking to my grandfather, he says it takes a certain type of ability to run something somebody's already built. It takes something with inside of you to create something of your own and then run it. And Ben had never built a hotel before. So there was the difference. And yes, there was a lot of cost overruns, some of it legitimate. It was right during the war and you couldn't get materials. There were inflated prices to even get materials. You also uh, had labor shortages. A lot of the men that knew how to building, you know, carpenters, uh, bricklayers, all the people you would need, plumbers, they were still in the war. So you had to pay three times the amount to get somebody to work on a, a project for you, you know, so. And, uh, you know, he did purchase a bunch of land around the casino. That was another expense that we definitely know about. Um, 
there's people that rumor that he was a gambler. I personally don't believe that to an, you know, at least to an excessive point where he'd lose money. So, uh, you see what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get through the myth of your grandfather, knowing how we know about the everyday choices that have to be made on the street, real time, real here. He was obviously a very intelligent guy. He was obviously a pragmatist, but we all know that within that life, it's your best friend that comes to kill you, usually anyway, if that's what's going on. But of course, there's a long way in getting down that road if it becomes so bad. But what I'm saying is, when you get to the end of that road, and there are other forces that work here, and they say, look, we've done everything here. We don't see any other way forward, Maya. He's got to go. What would Maya have said? Even though there's no, there's no question he would have loved Benny to the end. Right. What would if, you know, I know um, he was a figures man, and he never really said that he was a gangster, but he was around some of the most iconic gangsters of the time. There's right. no doubt about that. And they right. shaped what was to be the modern mafia. So I just wondered where he actually stood on that, Maya. Well, first, there's there's really no proof that he that the mob ever killed him. It looks that way. Yeah. And a lot of people think that. There's many theories. It, it'll never be solved, obviously, because whoever knows it is long gone. Um, and you got to ask yourself the question too, you know, people put up arguments if, you know, they wouldn't have kept giving Ben money. I don't personally think for what I know, if they knew that at one point they couldn't get their money back, you know what I mean? They were intelligent businessmen. They would have just said, Ben, that's it. We're not giving you any more. Enough's enough. Just logic. Yeah, throw good so money no, the yeah. My grandfather was just yeah. as surprised, um, as anybody else. I'm sure he probably knew the road Ben was going down and he warned him a few times. I don't think he knew it was at that level personally when they were, because they were making a profit on the second go around when Ben finished off the rooms and he had another couple months prior to June 20th, few months, um, that things were picking up and started to make a profit. So the best I could tell you is I, I don't think my grandfather, um, I'm not so sure that the mob did do that. It looks that way. You got to remember too, Ben was out in Hollywood, California for 10 years prior to coming to Las Vegas. And he took everything under him, the, the leadership role in Los Angeles. And he, you know, had all the bookies on, on his uh, payroll. He was, you know, he probably made them mad because he was increasing their prices to use his wire service. So it could have been uh, a lot of different people and reasons. And it was a sniper, wasn't it? It was a sniper bullet. It wasn't up close. It was a sniper bullet. Right, from a distance. You know, yeah, so from a probably distance, uh, right? 15 feet away, yes. You know, there's going to be photos there of some of these uh, guys, for some people who may not recall, although it's very iconic. There's some photos on there. So what did, what did, what did your grandfather actually say about what he felt about Benny and his murder at that time? Oh, he actually wished he would have been around forever. Uh, he, he loved Ben. He was childhood friends with him. They were each other's best men at their weddings. Uh, my grandmother and Ben's wife, Esther, were, you know, they shopped together. They went to the, they grew up in the same neighborhood. So, you know, he, uh, he was very close to Ben Siegel. He was very sorry. That hurt him a lot when Ben was murdered. So. So. <laughs> I mean, your grandfather was so clever of all of this he navigated. We're talking 50 years at the top level of organized crime. Yes. And was never arrested for anything apart from when he come back for tax evasion and then was acquitted anyway. Right. So this is what we're talking about here. Right. So how did he tell you that he started getting into that, that life? I mean, he come up in the lower east side of Manhattan, as we know. So how did he start getting into that life? How did he tell you how he started that road? Well, he had a fascination with numbers and he was growing up in an area that, you know, as your eight year old, nine year old boy in New York city in the 19, 10, 11 year, you know, back in those days, there's a lot of things going on around you. And, um, 
he noticed the gambling and he had an, you know, he was able to calculate things. He's even as a young boy, he considered that entertaining and game, like a game to him. So, yeah. And then he started to figure out the games. Of course, he lost one time, which really made an imprint on him. He lost a nickel that he needed to my grand great grandparents would send him on the weekend to, to uh, get this. They didn't have their own stove in these flats in those days. So they'd have to go to a community baker to bake the pierogi that they ate on the Sabbath. And he lost that money. And that really uh, made an impact on him because it devastated his family. They couldn't cook the meal that week. So he promised himself he would never lose again. He would control the game. Eventually he knew that that was the only way that you could really win when the odds were in your favor. Yeah. And this was, you know, of course this was prohibition time. So he would have been, you know, in his twenties going into prohibition. Yeah. This was really the era of the gangster, right? Yes. <clears throat> so what was his role? We know he was a figures man, but I've got to be honest with you, Maya. For anyone else who's looking in, it seemed to be a lot more than that. What can you tell us about that? Ben was more of the, you know, he had, my grandfather would figure things out. Now, there was a case during the uh, Prohibition time early on. They were in their teens and they were working for the older bosses at that time. And they would pick liquor up in Philadelphia. They would route it back towards New York City to uh, disperse, you know, disperse it amongst their um, clubs, their, you know, their speakeasies. Okay. Yeah. So my grandfather would write out the maps for Ben Siegel, who would be on the trucks, leading the trucks from Philadelphia back to New York City with the liquor. And that was his role. He was in charge of that. Ben was more the lookout uh, if there was any problems along the way. Actually, you know, there was think times when they would actually pay people. They didn't want to just shoot them up and steal their liquor, but they would negotiate with them. I know a lot of people don't believe, you know, they, they're always thinking gangsters or they just pull a gun out. They, they didn't do that all the time. And Ben was in charge. He was in the front and they had a couple of trucks behind him. And my grandfather would figure out the route that would be the easiest to get back, depending on where, you know, people were or where they, you know, you know they might have a problem with other rival gangs. And that was his role early on, you know, and then of course, adding everything up, keeping the figures in his head, the profits, all those things. Numbers, man. Yeah, absolutely. He was, you know, he was Numbers man, right? uh, exceptionally gifted in that. Here's another thing I want to say about Ben as well, right? Is because look, and I always thought about this was when he was killed in Beverly Hills, right? When he was shot in Beverly Hills, um, Gus Greenbaum and Mo Sedway, 20 minutes later, walked into the Flamingo and took charge of it. Yes. They, now, that suggests to me, Maya, that they had fast news. Anyway, they had fast news that he had been hit. There's a lot of money involved in this. It would even get me to suggest to say what I know about the world of organised crime, that there was a strategy here, Right. And they tidied it up. They went down there. So it was, you know, everyone knew what they were doing. So it right. seems that people would have known he was going to be, he was going to be uh, hit mine. What do right. you say about that? Um, like I say, it's still an unsolved case. I mean, it's possible. Sure. There's a, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, my opinion is I don't, I really don't think so. I, I my grandfather, he was never an actor, so he wouldn't hide his, he, he would have a hard time hiding things. If, if he knew that Ben was going to have Ben hit and he had to either walk out of the room or what had happened, just not ask questions, he wouldn't have hid that very well. He wasn't, you know, that type of person. When the telegram came out to Las Vegas the day after Ben was murdered, um, you know, he was in shock the way he wrote it, you know, tell people to wait till I get out there. Don't give any markers, lock down the cage. He was shocked. So, you know, I think at one time there was probably a possibility. He thought, Ben, you better watch it. You know, Ben knew what, what he was doing. You know, he knew there was, could have been consequences if there was that many problems going on. But uh, 
I don't think my grandfather thought it was at the level at that yet because they were making a profit. So, you know, mm. if he later found something out, he wouldn't talk about it. He would never say anything about it. He would have just gone on with things, you know. Kept well, that, you know, that gives me something about the man again because yeah. just through these questions, Maya, you know, the audience can get a good opinion about what the actual man was like. So right. tell us about, right, you know, so Prohibition, Benny's on the trucks, they're coming up, you know, your grandfather's there, he's doing the numbers, they're getting their heads together, you know, they're looking at the money of it all, where to go next. Where does Luciano come into it at this point? What did he tell you about that? Well, Luciano, you know, uh, there was two old bosses from Sicily, Maranzano Masseria, and they were all working for them at that time. They were younger. So you're looking at about, what, 13 years, 1933, Prohibition was over. And Luciano had a problem because he had to take sides. He either went with Maranzano or he went with Masseria. Things were getting real tough for him. Uh, he was, you know, secretly talking to my grandfather. My grandfather knew what was going on, so did Ben Siegel. So there was there was a time when he Ben Sieg, or Luciano was called to talk to uh, Maranzano in his office, and my grandfather caught wind that he was going to be murdered. That Luciano would have, would have been murdered if he would have gone to that office. So he had to set up and interfere with that, and that's where you see history is correct. They sent in men looking like they were police officers. And when they got in there, they, you know, eliminated Maranzano and that was it. And then he had, you know, then he had to, the other boss to deal with. So uh, he was in a sticky position until they were both gone. And then they, the reason that they also wanted to take over and make it an American mafia is because they wanted to expand. They wanted to go nationwide with prohibition. And, you know, the old boss had just wanted to stay in New York City. So that was another reason they wanted to uh, dispose of both of them at that time. So That's a great piece of history there. Thanks for yeah. that. So um, there's a lot of talk. They say that Charles Lucky, Luciano, got his name Lucky because they took him away. He got tortured there. and But he lived. He got out of a bad scrape. Is this the truth? I don't really know. I've never, um, there's a couple reasons, you know, most of those men have some kind of name. They always gave them nicknames. It usually is pretty logical. I mean, he either was a lucky gambler or he was lucky to save his life. Uh, you know, some, some of those names are known for what they are and others, uh, in history, there's a couple options. I, I never, as far as myself, I never knew any more than anybody else about that, you know? I never discussed this with my grandfather when he was alive because it just, you know, wasn't a place I could go with him, you know? So I learned it from other people and my father and things, and you know, like that. So I think it was probably the fact that he made it out of that situation where they almost killed him, to be honest, that would be the most logical. And they called him lucky. Man, I was just, I was just, yeah. I was just thinking, I didn't say it. He yeah. was certainly lucky with Maranzano. So the name should definitely stick. You know, that's, that's yes. right. So, yeah, because there's been you know a lot, a lot over this, and I just wondered, but uh, that helps there. So, so they kind of went into business together from this point. Is this what you're saying? Well, they were all in business together early on. They just weren't in a major nationwide business at that time. They were up and coming, but no, they were at the beginning of prohibition. They were in business working for Masario and Maranzano, the two older bosses. They were doing what they want. You know, they were employed by them. And then Arnold Rosting came into the picture, oh, the grandpa's side, and, you know, he had this Jewish element at that time. He saw a promise in my grandfather because they both had great minds for numbers. So he mentored him, and they all worked together on different projects, Prohibition being the biggest money earner at that time for 13 years. I put all the money in there port where they were able to buy everything really at that you know they were the power source this is interesting so you know i mean i'll get a picture now when they come up as children even that thing that 
Charles Luciano ahead with your father. So they come up together. Now, he had his own gang, didn't he? So they would have been more Italian. But this is a real change in mob history, right? It yes. was a real pivot because they weren't made. But it didn't matter that these guys was made. Was there some people who was made under Charles Luciano or was they made or was no one made? They was a collection of guys that just had a kind of a hierarchy. How was it? Well, you know, the, the tradition when my grandfather and Luciano got together and they, they worked together on this also, they actually invented the American mafia is what they did. And my grandfather had a big say in that too. And he did tell Lucky, Charlie Lucky, we called him, by the way, um, that uh, you should keep some of the tradition because younger people like that. Not all of it, but some of it. And the Luciano agreed. But as far as uh, when they integrated with Jews and some Irish even at the time, they, uh, they were just, uh, they didn't consider themselves the old school where they were going to keep all the tradition. You could only be Italian. You could only be, that was just kind of went to the wayside, you know. They were all highly competent. They saw no reason being in America that they had to do anything like the old school did, you know. Thanks for tuning in, guys, to a wonderful new segment of The Big Shift with Stephen Gillen. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengillen.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey of success.